Hey, everybody. Welcome to today's installment of How to Unfuck Your Future. Last week, we talked about all the ways that we're fucked, quite frankly. But this week, it's been nice respite to hear about all of the solutions. Yesterday, Rao was talking to Yatsu about the continuing growth of play-to-earn gaming, as well as basic equity versus universal basic income. If you didn't listen to that conversation after this one, you should really check it out. Today's discussion is all about tech investment. But what I think is really intriguing here, you're not just going to hear a conversation of people saying, buy tech, get these high valuations. It's a much more nuanced picture. And to have that discussion, we've got Jordi Visser with us, a Real Vision favorite, former CIO and president of West Multi-Strategy Advisor and lead contributor to In the Search of Green Marbles podcast. And Jordi's going to be talking to Beth Kindig, CEO and lead tech analyst at the IO Fund. You guys know Beth from that famous conversation she had with me calling NVIDIA in January of 2023, up just about 468% from then to today. And of course, if you want more of Beth's work, you can always check her out at the Real Vision Marketplace, realvision.com slash Beth. Great deal on her work there. And the people that we talk to in our community just love what they get from there. So with that, Jordi, I hand it over to you to unfuck our future, please. <laughs> Thanks, Samuel. Um, first of all, I, I just want to say this is uh, this is an interesting situation for me, and I, I'm just going to introduce Beth in in a unique way. Uh, first of all, when you're talking about the future, anytime you're talking about the future, as someone who spends his entire time trying to get a sense as to places where the future I think will happen will be different than where the majority of people think, which I think is what a lot of investing is about. Uh, I gather most of my information from other people. Um, I listen to lots of various people on, on a given topic. And one of the things that's the most important for me is sourcing people who have different views than I do. And I came across Beth probably two months ago. Someone recommended, um, me to listen to the podcast she did with Raul or the interview she did with Raul, um, specifically on AI with a little bit on crypto, which is a lot of what we're going to talk about today. And there's a lot of places in there where I was very strongly disagreeing in terms of some of the things she was saying. But over time, as I've read more of it and I've, I've spent time, she's done what I try to find for anyone. And so I highly recommend you guys spend time on this. She is a good thought provoker. Um, she took my views. She didn't al alter them completely, but I think there's a few nuances within my views on AI and crypto and centralization, which we'll get into today. So uh, I highly recommend spending time listening to Beth. So welcome, Beth. Um, we, this is our first time together, but uh, I wanted to throw some positive uh, words your way to start out. Thanks, Jordy. Yeah, very kind of you to introduce me. Appreciate let's being just, here. Let's jump right into it. Um, so you have written about for a long time, artificial intelligence. Can you just remind everyone, uh, how important it is and really the amount of time you've been writing about it? Cause you were one of the early people to spend time on, on highlighting that it was starting now. Yes. And so, you know, 2010, 2011, I was in Silicon Valley, um, basically, doing in-depth work to help technologists determine out of 2000 ad products or 70 cybersecurity products, which is the one that deserves an eight figure or nine figure partnership. Um, I found that this was really needed. Uh, it was suggested to me that I take those skills, which is speaking to people in Silicon Valley who are deep into tech and explaining tech to a point where they can make a big decision around this vast competitive landscape. Um, Clearly, if I can do that, maybe you can go talk to finance people in New York about tech um, would be much easier and probably more needed. Uh, so in instantly, I started to garner some attention around my unique analysis because uh, what I'm always doing is connecting the dots in, a, in the competitive landscape, meaning uh, whether investors realize it or not, uh, you're choosing one out of many, many companies in order to say this one's going to be the winner. If you have a cybersecurity company in your portfolio, you're choosing one out of 70. That's very hard to do. So uh, what I do is I make that process very, very easy, as easy as possible. And so the minute I started writing in 2018 on the free, just entirely free to see how it would go, uh, I started talking about how, why NVIDIA would have a moat uh, based on the data center, uh, GPU-driven data center. Uh, it's AI. Uh, angle 
including versus a company like Xilinx, which has now been acquired by AMD. So I was so far back on this that you probably don't even recognize some of the some of the AI companies because they were beginning to be acquired. Um, but Xilinx is one company that was up against NVIDIA, now owned by AMD. And I was comparing GPUs versus uh, field programmable chips and ASICs, basically. And I was saying in this competitive landscape, GPUs are going to be where it's at. And then I started talking about things like Microsoft Azure and why was Azure, uh, you know, why Azure would blow uh, Google Cloud out of the water and nip at the heels of AWS. And this was when Microsoft was selling off and was not known as a cloud infrastructure as a service company. So all of that started to really gel. And since 2018, I've written about NVIDIA's AI thesis over 25 times, specifically AI. I said in 2021 that NVIDIA would surpass Apple to become the most the world's most valuable company. And so you have to go back in time. But in 2022, uh, this company, NVIDIA sold off 60%. People thought it was over when Ethereum merged to proof of stake. Uh, and there was a big gaming miss. There was a massive 2.5 billion gaming miss. Fortunately, I was reported on live news, Fox Business News. I appear there frequently with Charles Payne as well as others saying, this is a buy. It's not about gaming. It's not about crypto mining. This is about AI. And like, you know, so so the good news is that there was definitely, uh, you know, a, a, a nice a track record there. And uh, just giving you some background as to why why I was able to do that and why I think my firm will continue to be able to find the right AI choices as we move forward to it. NVIDIA clearly big leader, undeniable today, but we think this has a long runway and we're prepared to find more winners. Can you add to, to that discussion? So from, from a credibility basis, you've been talking about this as early as anyone and, and the impact that it would have. And before I kind of shift into comparing it to mobile, since you were you were a part of that time period too in Silicon Valley, can you just kind of give people your views on the top-down impact that AI is going to have on the economy for corporations, just so people can kind of put into context how big this is, maybe even relative to mobile from a top-down basis before we get into the investment cycle? Yes, and I think that's a great question because it's one thing to pick a great product and to analyze the product, which I think is absolutely, first and foremost, how to choose great tech stocks. But you have to look at total addressable market. Uh, you have to look at product market fit. And those are those things like, for AI, what kind of impact is it going to have on GDP? Um, you know, I've seen the 15 trillion, but McKinsey and others are now raising it to a 25 trillion impact on GDP. Um, you can assume mobile is three to four trillion, maybe four to five, depending on how you chop up smartphones, applications, app stores, uh, things like that. Right around, let's just give it the highest estimate of five trillion. We're looking at 3x minimum, 5x right now. Uh, and these estimates keep getting raised. So the 15 trillion was, you know, maybe two years ago, and uh, the 25 trillion has been a revision. So uh, this is the impact of GDP, and that's something we've never seen before in my lifetime, in previous generation, next generation. So when you when you take that kind of product market fit is is the best way I would describe it. Meaning you are solving clear problems to have that kind of an impact on GDP, which would be productivity. Um, and then you match it with the right product. What you have is this hockey stick explosive growth. Um, and so people are really trying to wrap their heads around this and say, you short, the short sellers, I guess, would be the easiest ones to pick on. And they're saying, you know, NVIDIA is too popular now. Um, it's got to end eventually. Uh, look at this company up 400 or more percent. But what they're not understanding is that that's nothing compared to the impact these GPUs are going to have on GDP uh, now and into the foreseeable future. Um, so that's the piece, I think, that combination, that merging of product with addressable market and product market fit, which macro people will say in these GDP numbers. Um, for me, it's really about um, you know, solving enough problems that it's driving down those costs for enterprises, uh, which is basically just talking about it in two different ways. Uh, that is something to just sit up in your chair and really pay attention and to not fight the trend. 
Yeah, and so so people can put some of those numbers into context. Whether it's 15 trillion or 25 trillion, you're you're doing that in an economy that right now has a size of between 25 and 30 trillion. So you're talking about a a massive impact, and whether it's through 2040 or 2050. Um, I think where Beth and I right off the bat are on the same page is this is a macro trend that is going to dominate our world going forward uh, much more than mobile. And it's really hard for anyone to think, you know, in 2007, before the iPhone was launched, what our lives, our lives were like without having that gadget. So now we're talking fast forward the same amount of time. And the reason um, interviews or podcasts like this to me are so important is because when the macro lines up, with some of the micro stories, which you're seeing now, if we increase the economy by say $15 trillion, well, there's a relationship between the market cap of public companies historically and GDP. And so what you're talking about is an expansion in public companies. Uh, and that means investing, you're going to find opportunities. And right now we're, we're looking like there's a bull market without having the traditional cycle of the past. And I think that's why these types of conversations are so important. And I think on the mobile side, Beth, since you know, you used it as a comparison of how how much bigger or how much uh, more important this could be. Could you kind of take everyone through? Because you said something interesting on on a on a brief prep call we did the other day, and this was the most important uh, thought provoking moment for me on this comment about we went from two million apps to eventually ten apps. And the reason that's so important in in the context now, most people are worried that this has gone too far too fast because valuations are clearly expanding to levels and no one knows what the proper valuation is for NVIDIA. But when you have a mega trend that's going so fast, the market does discount a lot of the future. But if that just continues to go parabolic, then the valuations, as we learned from 2009 on, can stay high for a long time. So can you take everyone on a comparison uh, and using that 2 million apps to 10 apps for, for the prior decade? Yes. And I think what I'm encouraging people to realize is that even if we have a wave of innovation from the private markets, that can be quite exciting. And I would say mobile is more democratized hands down than AI, meaning other than software programmer costs, you're, you're coding. I mean, it's free. Uh, AI, you know, has GPUs and power and other, you know, costs inherent to training a model um, that weren't present for mobile. Uh, so anyways, backing up, a wave of innovation such as mobile will often put on the market 2 million apps. Uh, but in the long run, fast forward 10 years, most people use about 10. Uh, I'll never forget the gaming boom. Uh, for me, that was an exciting time because we were, you know, just constant mobile events everywhere. I was going to two to three events a day. Uh, it was very, very exciting time. And many of those gaming companies, you know, are, are not very successful today. Either they closed their doors or they're private. They had to be brought back private, things like that. Zynga, maybe the poster child for that, but there's some out of Japan and, um, Europe and whatnot. And so to watch that popularity of having hundreds of millions of users that faded is uh, a warning sign that I like to talk to public investors about uh, because it's just simply a hype cycle, which is that you'll go through a lot of innovation that is absolutely necessary. Uh, you'll get lots of exciting apps, but then over time, the hype fades on the user side and those businesses don't last. Uh, this is present, the, 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 the public markets like to call it the dot-com uh, boom and bust. It's happened with every, every area of tech in, in, in all facets. <laughs> I, you know, I'm talking about gaming right now because it's so niche. And, I, you know, and of course, it had a boom and a bust. Uh, mobile had a boom and a bust. And you may not have noticed because uh, we have a few big winners, Meta, Google, Apple. Uh, you may not have realized that there's, you know, 99% went out of business. Um, a lot of that was in the private markets. But you can expect something similar to happen with AI uh, as what we've seen with mobile. And I would even say maybe at a higher rate. Well, that's one of the, this is the reason I said this was a thought provoking moment for me is I've written and said many, many times that for me, and I still believe this, but this is where you changed kind of my view in one sense, which I'll, I'll ask you to, to expand upon. Uh, I do believe smaller businesses are are going to have the long-term advantage from AI, mainly because 
what we did see in the prior decade is that you were able to grow a business without debt, uh, meaning you could actually grow um, in a different way than you had in the Industrial Revolution. So to me, this was the inflection point to where the digital economy took over to a much greater degree than it already had. And once that got to the point that it is now, uh, we're losing business cycles. And for me, we're going to have a lot of failures of businesses because interest rates are high, but also because the most talented people are going to use AI and realize that this expansion of, of, of ideas will not only need less debt, but it also need less people because you can start a business and have grow it without the same amount of, of employee growth that you used to have in the past. And to me, that's a very big advantage in the same way that you didn't have debt where you didn't need to expand to other locations the same way. So you had this virtual world. So this is just the next stage for me uh, of smaller businesses. But your point is, is what got me thinking that, okay, we could both be right, meaning it could be another 10 years before small businesses actually catch up. And what you're saying is at a time when the stock market uh, is very narrow in terms of participation, uh, your argument, which I, I hear, and it may last for longer, I think, that the NVIDIAs, the Googles, the Metas, they may have a huge advantage here, Microsoft, uh, Salesforce, in terms of the rollout and actually monetizing AI for the, for, AI for the near term. So the big question um, for me to you is, how long do you think this concentration can last? And do you think it'll last even longer than I believe? Yes. So I think we're seeing it, evidence of it right now. Uh, the Mag Seven, what do they have that other companies don't have? Um, well, Balmer said developers, 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 and I think AI will be data sets, data sets, data sets. Um, so there's the cost of trading a model that is very different from the democratization of mobile, which I would say is one of the most democratized uh, innovations. Uh, again, due to the fact that you're basically paying for a programmer's time. If you happen to be a programmer uh, or have a couple of friends that are programmers, you can do it for very little cost. Um, where this just isn't the reality it's for, it was, you know, chat GPT has said it's about 4 million, uh, in product cost, let alone programmers and AI engineers. Um, so we're already starting to see this evidence that something about having large proprietary data sets is what set is what sets you apart. Um, and so now we have an issue where if you're a startup, uh, or a small company, do you even have the data set? In order to train these models, a lot of people have followed Tesla for a long time. What are the chances that Tesla would ever give away the data set that their fleet has created and generated over the last, you know, however many years? They're going to protect that with everything they have, uh, not only because of the costs that it required to, to, to create that data set, uh, but because it's really, um, you know, their secret sauce. Uh, it's Google's secret sauce. They clearly have a lot of money for R&D. Uh, these companies have big CapEx budgets, but it's to me, it comes down to that proprietary data set. Um, and I think we are seeing evidence that big tech will only get bigger. Uh, I think that this is actually good news for public investors. Rarely, uh, I, I would say that rarely have we seen, you know, such a big move from what was already a large market cap NVIDIA. Um, I would look toward that happening more. Um, this is great news for public investors because we've never had the opportunity to get in on these big power moves that these trends can generate to this extent, considering that most of these companies, in my opinion, that will dominate in AI are already public instead of having a mix of public and private that then you wait for that private company to go public, um, you know, insiders cash in, et cetera. So in this case, if you can find those public companies that are going to benefit, of course, um, there's also those who have smaller data sets that will improve their own platforms. Salesforce is a great example. Don't They don't have the data set that Google has, but they have a big enough data set uh, to improve their process through Einstein, uh, you know, help, uh, you know, increase productivity across sales and marketing teams. So we will certainly see those cases too. Um, I don't own Salesforce, but I'm just using them as an example since most people understand that company well. Uh, you'll certainly see those as well. And that's what I mean about this great opportunity for public investors is that a lot of these companies with these proprietary data sets are already public. So now you just have to pick the one out of the 70 cybersecurity or you know, some of those would be private, but you have to pick one out of a couple dozen 
or you have to pick one out of, you know, um, a couple dozen, um, you know, productivity or, um, software platforms or data platforms. Um, and, and that piece is exciting to me. And it's exciting to me that we've had a public company go up 400% off this trend, because usually that was only happening in the private markets at this stage, very nascent AI just started and the public, uh, investors get to participate. It's awesome. Hey, sorry to interrupt again. Uh, it's Raul here from Real Vision. I'd love for you to subscribe to the channel, get the notifications. We have so many incredible conversations with so many amazing people. It will really help you in your financial journey and your journey to understand just what the hell's going on in this world. Anyway, click subscribe, get the notifications and enjoy. And, and I think for, for me, in listening to what you said, the way that I've now incorporated this into the way that I think, I'm, I'm a, uh, for spending my time on recessions or market corrections, I'm always looking for leading economic indicators, leading indicators in the market, things like breath for, for the market. And while breath has been it just, it just has not been good for uh, the last 15 months, Effectively, what you're saying and what I'm starting to build in more to my views is if those companies do have the advantage, you need to start focusing on them uh, a lot more for an indication that maybe the market's running out of steam. Uh, just because if it's being driven by AI, I do believe that companies see a change sooner than others. So if NVIDIA all of a sudden has an earnings report where they disappoint or something changes and you, you have the same thing happening for Meta and you have it happening for Microsoft and it's not about cost cutting anymore, that may those may be, because when you get this narrow, it becomes easier to see signs. So I'm going to take what you said there and that's the way I'm going to incorporate it. I'm changing some of my models to say those names are going to be more important. Can you... Speaking of the breath, I think a great place to go. It, you you were early on Nvidia. It's obviously had a huge move. Um, outside of Nvidia, are there other semis uh, in particular that you like? And then outside of semiconductors, are there other parts of of technology sectors or industries that you think will eventually benefit more from artificial intelligence as we move forward in this trend? Yeah, those those are great questions. Uh, when it comes to the narrowness of the bull cycle, I will I will say we're we're all, we're almost always in a neutral stance. Uh, we were with Real Vision VIP members, or I was back in January, and I was saying when you look at Microsoft's chart, this thing looks like it put in a major top, and in February so far, Microsoft has, um, and I, and we own Microsoft, so. Uh, you know, we're very neutral, meaning that when we look at a company like NVIDIA or Microsoft or whatever it might be, we continually evaluate if 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 it's cheap enough. Um, and we're not always ultra bulls. Uh, we use risk management first and foremost. Uh, it's tech portfolios make a big mistake by letting um, you know, the excitement and the and the and the bull story take over. Uh, usually those bull stories will take care of themselves and you've got to know when to apply the brakes. And that's the piece that I think separates our firm from others. And so I, I do want to throw in there that uh, candidly on our webinars with our premium members, we have been saying uh, that this is concerning to us because despite the phenomenal gains that, you know, NVIDIA, real revenue growth here uh, that the company has put up, uh, it's not broad enough to protect you know, tech as a sector. So we're looking for ways to use risk management right now. Sometimes that means trimming. I said on Fox, we were trimming super micro pretty heavily. Uh, and it's just because risk reward isn't there right now for us on super micro. So I, I do want to say with the narrowness of the bull cycle, typically when we're asked about it as a firm, uh, we see it as a concern. Um, but then when you asked, I think you asked about- um, Other sectors or other semiconductor companies that you like? Yeah, so I guess I would preface all this and just say get comfortable with semiconductors. Um, they are uh, fifty percent of the AI market. That's up from twenty to thirty percent of the mobile market, and they will be for us uh, the right way to participate in AI in the near term. Um, we had like forty five percent allocation going into twenty twenty three to AI. I want to say forty percent of that was semiconductors. Um, and the other thing that I guess if there's anything you get out of this conversation today, uh, it's that 
the semiconductors are going to become the AI software players. Uh, already, uh, NVIDIA, the biggest announcements this past week, in my opinion, are the Omniverse Cloud APIs. Um, Apple is now partnering with NVIDIA on Omniverse for Vision Pro headsets. Like, since when does Apple partner with somebody on software um, to attract developers? Like, this is a big, this is a, if, 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 if you know, like Apple's history with developers and they're now uh, going to leverage NVIDIA to make sure that they have enough development for that device, it's like, whoa, this is a big moment. Um, and it, this is across the board that NVIDIA not only has had uh, the opportunity to have these GPUs uh, pre-launch, of course, it's their GPUs, um, but they're also just the closest to the problems that need to be solved. So they're building software uh, rapidly to uh, facilitate renting of GPUs in the cloud, uh, to facilitate better development across the board for AI. Um, Broadcom uh, is one that we don't own, but we're looking to own, is because uh, custom silicon is going to be desirable for big tech. So big tech will want to create in-house silicon uh, to whatever extent they can, while still probably having to use NVIDIA. It will be a mix. Uh, this will help them on application-specific workloads. And Broadcom is the favorite choice for that right now. And going back to software, uh, right now, uh, most of you know, they acquired VMware, and they're already rapidly accelerating on the software side uh, post-acquisition because what they're doing is they're creating um, a private cloud environment uh, through VMware's virtual uh, software fabric. And they are uh, allowing that data to remain on premise because it goes back to those data sets for AI. So long-term, uh, Broadcom's got um, you know, their ring in the, in the game on software as well, including, you know, how do you create a, a virtual uh, cloud environment where you can use your on-prem data? Um, so that piece is really cool to me. <laughs> um, you know, as you can see, I, I get pretty excited about this stuff. Um, AMD is going to answer to NVIDIA this year. Like, let's pony up. Let's see what the pricing power uh, does there. NVIDIA has had no competitor. You could probably go round and round on a good debate on how strong of a design company AMD is, it's completely underestimated. This company is very strong on design, um, where Intel, maybe not so much. So those are some of the more exciting things. And then um, to break it outside of the semiconductors, uh, they've really dominated data, cloud, uh, data center AI, and it's going to move to the edge. So edge AI. Um, we're going to see a major upgrade cycle on your smartphones, uh, laptops, computers, because there's only so much AI can do in the data center, inference has to run close to the user. Uh, so more powerful devices, uh, you know, uh, edge network. That piece is, I would call, uh, the next phase of AI, and we're starting to get positioned for that. Uh, you'll start to hear about it mid-2024 when Qualcomm comes out with an ARM-based PC. But I think 2025 is really the year for edge AI, and we're getting positioned for that now. Um, and then we do hold a cybersecurity company. Um, cybersecurity is basically a data problem. So there's a natural affinity uh, with cybersecurity and automation. Uh, you won't hear the big headlines. Like you will hear Palantir's commercial segment is up however much and their uh, artificial intelligence platform is up X amount. That's not as what the cybersecurity companies will report. In my opinion, it could change, but I it's just overall revenue growth because automation is just integrated into every piece of their platform. So where analysts that are moving very quickly and journalists that are moving very quickly, they need to really quick grab that AI number from the earnings call and put it out. Um, they're not gonna be able to quickly grab an AI number from cybersecurity because it's so fully integrated due to it being really a data problem for many years now, uh, has been solved through automation and AI. And then generative AI is only gonna make it easier for people with lower uh, level security skills to work with those products. That's great. Um, that's all the, uh, I guess, the the optimistic side of ways to, to play it um, from what's working or what's attached to AI. Let's just go a, a little bit of a different direction for a minute here uh, because the prior decade, 
you know, just as an example, um, for people sitting there, they probably have some investments that AI is going to disrupt as well. Uh, and if you were, you know, in auto companies coming out of the great financial crisis and you didn't have Tesla, which grew rapidly and all the other auto companies combined just sat there uh, and Amazon dominated the brick and mortars, are there sectors, stocks or or companies with inside tech that AI is going to disrupt that people should maybe check their portfolios and reduce positions or completely get rid of? Yeah, that that's a great question. I guess the one area that we've shifted dramatically away from um, is having a portfolio loaded with cloud. So in 2019, our portfolio was a lot of cloud. It kind of worked out because then COVID happened. Um, but we were in a kind of a boom cycle with cloud. People love public markets, love the annual recurring revenue. Uh, and in general, uh, you know, rates were low, very low. So those cash strapped cloud companies did well uh, with high stock based compensation, all of the above. And uh, the cloud was doing very well. Um, we've shifted entirely. Our choices in cloud, uh, we have one true cloud stock outside of Microsoft, um, best of breed cloud stock, and it's because it's an edge AI play. Uh, otherwise, I haven't touched cloud really since we moved toward AI uh, with H100. We knew the H100 was coming out. Uh, we wrote about it on the free newsletter in October of 2022. So we were really moving toward AI. And I mean, I ruthlessly cut cloud and got some feedback from it since people were so enamored with cloud. Uh, I just said it's a landmine. It's so hard to pick out a good cloud stock at this point because that hype cycle is gone. It's over. So what that means is we'll go through a period of consolidation. Uh, the weak will get acquired or go out of business. The strong will move on and the strong have to have an AI play. So look for uh, maybe 50% of the cloud stocks on the market today to not be around in 10 years. Uh, don't want to get caught holding that one myself. Uh, not only that, but they're not the best on cash compared to something like ad tech, very cash efficient sector vertical. Um, so that piece is problematic at right now. Ultimately, um, you know, we are very, very selective in cloud. And if you were to tell me which, if you were to ask me which vertical is kind of a hot potato, uh, I would say cloud because of the hype cycle merging with AI, merging with the fact that there's, you know, the hype cycle means we're going to go through a period of consolidation mixed with uh, weak cash and bottom lines, very few are gap profitable. Uh, and, you know, for, for everyone watching, I, I think, um, you know, if you read history books on innovation, uh, there's always disrupted industries and companies. And I think what Beth just went through uh, those are important things to be looking around with too, because a lot of times, especially when you have a narrow market, as we've discussed, if you went back and look at the S&P 500 and looked at their the performance of each stock since even 20 years ago, you'd be shocked at how few participants have been able to generate gains. And if you go outside of the U.S., uh, MSCI World X, the United States, is still right around the same level it was in 2007, which means if you've been an investor outside of the U.S., you haven't done well. And I think that's why finding and making sure you're paying, uh, paying attention to who gets disrupted during innovation cycles is really important. It doesn't just have to be the sectors we're talking about. It can be globally, too. So this is why these types of conversations are good. Beth, I want to shift back um, towards the macro side. I'm I'm I'm. I'm a macro person, so I spend my time on on uh, these thoughts when it comes in. And I just I want to get your take on this. And we briefly had this conversation as part of the prep call, but I have been writing about for over the last decade, um, not only as the digital economy takes over more and more from the industrial economy, that by definition, that means we're heading closer and closer to a world of abundance and a way of one of scarcity. And scarcity is one of the things that has a huge impact on productivity and efficiency, particularly when you think of things like fossil fuels, um, the lifespan of, of, of individuals in the U.S. Lifespan is backing up somehow. We're, we're you know, over the last 10 years, it's gone backwards. Uh, and DeepMind has made a lot of advances in artificial intelligence, specifically on some of these points. So DeepMind made a huge advancement in the fourth quarter of last year in advanced materials and the ability of, of hopefully down the line, 
being able to create materials, uh, finding kind of the blueprint for them. And this is with uh, Gnome. Uh, at the same time, they made huge advancements in biology with AlphaFold back, uh, I think it was three, four years ago at this point. And then they're also doing, and, and they haven't released anything yet with a name or, or an acronym, but um, they're making advancements in fusion with energy too. So I've looked at this, that things like the price of oil, um, all kinds of things in the medical side, longevity, you're going to have a big change in some of the most important components that make up GDP. Have you thought about the impact that AI is going to have on, on more of a top-down basis? Uh, and if you specifically want to talk about DeepMind or any of the things there, I think people would love to hear about it and just provoke some thought. Yeah. I mean, I think when it comes to like industries like the healthcare industry, even though it is AI and DeepMind that will disrupt it, um, the thing about me is I tend to stay in my lane a lot. So I, I feel like the healthcare industry and pharma and drug discovery is really specialized. And uh, I would hesitate to expand too much in that industry. Uh, I would probably defer to someone like yourself. Um, you said that you listen to a lot of people. I would probably go check out what you've written um, because it's just not an area where I feel it goes back to like, can you pick out one out of 70 cybersecurity stocks? There were 2000 ad platforms when Meta, you know, rose, uh, in the stock market. Um, it's like, I, I you know, when it, due to the competitive nature of all of this, I don't know that I could pick out the winner in the healthcare world. Um, obviously deep mind is, um, you know, a Marvel and it's, uh, probably underreported. Uh, considering, you know, it's it's not as hardcore on the consumer side as, you know, chat GPT is getting a lot of attention because it's on the consumer side. Uh, Bard, now Gemini gets a lot of attention because they're on the consumer side. Um, so, you know, uh, I guess the one thing I would say is that, you know, going toward healthcare and, and others, uh, the theme that is, that I'm trying to communicate is that AI is really an enterprise technology. I think enterprise will lead. Um, I said this a few years ago, and then what happened is uh, just this week, we saw Inflection AI, um, basically they're shutting down. This was a $4 billion consumer startup that was going to compete with ChatGBT, $4 billion valuation, just got just got $1.5 billion in a funding round because uh, consumers very, very hard. So I think that you're on to something in terms of keeping it you know, enterprise, um, healthcare, uh, these areas that uh, consumers... Is it, this is not a consumer market, but within like healthcare and how deep mine is disrupting it, I would probably, you know, refer to someone like you and would love to hear your thoughts on it. Yeah. And, and just so people hear, because she mentioned AI drug discovery within that um, commentary, it, honestly, part, part of the success of Novo Nordisk um, and Eli Lilly and Ozempic and Wagovi is directly related to the advancements in artificial intelligence. And if you get the chance, I've referenced this a lot, but if you can find podcasts with Dave Johnson, who uh, at the time, and I think still is the, the chief AI person at Moderna, talking about what went on for them to come up with a vaccine in basically a weekend after they got the blueprint, it's a way for you to really let your mind wander and you start getting into some of these bigger problems. And the reason I'm so focused on them is because at some point over the next uh, less than 10 years, for sure, this will have an impact on a lot of different parts of the economy. And so when we talk about 15 to 20 $5 trillion. McKinsey keeps upping their numbers. Goldman does too. On the impact AI is going to have, uh, it's not only an investment trend, but I think for all of us, it's going to have a lot of disruptions. And that gets important for making sure that your kids are entering the right fields and getting involved in things and paying attention. So uh, I think I think there's a lot in there from a top-down basis. I did want to kind of finish up our part here before we give the Real Vision crew um, the opportunity to bring some questions. Um, can can you just give a brief view of of crypto? Because in your world of of centralization, still continuing, and again, I'm I'm going to say that I've expanded my views. That maybe instead of uh, the market discounting this in this year, maybe it discounts it in three years. But I'm still going to stick with my belief that we're headed to less centralization and more decentralization on on every level. And for that reason, I've been very, very outspoken about the fact that I believe uh, Bitcoin, which to me is the 
S&P 500, the amorphous investment vehicle of the crypto world, that in a world where AI is impacting um, authenticity, where it's forcing um, more at this point uh, distributional wealth problems and the need for more tokenization to open up investment opportunities for people and, and spread kind of the wealth of selling off or, or participating in more of the economy, that crypto is actually one of the interesting offshoots of AI, and it's very hard for people to buy into it. I don't know where your views are, but can you give kind of how you guys are approaching crypto it, within the context of AI? Sure. Uh, we don't own any, uh, you know, AI crypto tokens right now. Uh, we do own two layer ones, uh, layer two or middleware and Bitcoin, of course. But so we have decent crypto exposure and always have, you know, since we started. Um, but I guess when I think about AI and crypto, the Problem goes back to the data sets, the proprietary data sets. So even if you can facilitate like a data exchange, uh, you know, even reward people for their data, um, adhere to more privacy uh, features into the, you know, the, the process. Uh, the problem, I think, is that proprietary data set. So where I see a few things, meaning big tech will never give up their data sets or cooperate with decentralization. Uh, unless they're forced. So I think, I guess there's three ways that this could move towards decentralization. Um, AI, specifically with these hard, heavily guarded data sets that are creating fortresses as we speak. Um, and again, I go back to the example of Tesla. Most people would logically say, why would Tesla share their data set? I think Tesla investors get that. Um, and I'm just using them as an example because we we tend to think a lot about Google or Facebook because of the social aspect and the search, but it, it's all across the board. It was very costly to build those data sets. I'd say there's like three ways. Uh, users finally wake up and they say, hey, this is our data. Uh, I don't know if that will happen. Uh, social media use is more like a, a cigarette or nicotine addiction. Uh, people are completely, you know, uh, not aware as to how much they're giving up and how much control big tech has within those news feeds. Uh, most people you have a conversation with. They don't know what you're talking about. Um, so that's not good uh, in terms of the possibility there. And then secondly, I would say um, the government uh, regulating if we go through a period of dystopia where big tech has ruled it all. Um, but that piece is also challenging. Or the third, which is my favorite, and this is the one I would guess and continue to monitor the space for, is you get some brilliant blockchain developers that create must-have applications and you see a migration uh, go toward blockchain, and then these search engines and uh, social media apps from you know a decade ago no longer have that relevancy that they have uh, that they've enjoyed. So now blockchain starts to control more of the data. Uh, you know you have uh, blockchain applications and developers that have you know the data sets you know building daily, weekly, over time that are needed for real AI applications. So that's the one that I like the best um, is it, it's an innovation disruption. So I would keep an eye out for those big applications and you know that are gonna get people to move over to the blockchain. And that's when the AI moment can start. And again, it's all about the data sets. Well, I'm just gonna jump back in here now because we have a lot of questions coming in. And I just have to say, I take a lot of notes during interviews, but I think this might have been one of the ones where I most have taken notes. Jordi, I really just have to commend you because talking about how you're making that adjustment, that's really where the fascinating stuff happens in this space. So it's really interesting to hear how you're adjusting based on what uh, you've read and seen from Beth. And Beth, the last time you told me, if you just remember one thing, it was quite a, a big thing with NVIDIA. So I'm just highlighting what you said if you remember just one thing from this interview, that semiconductors are going to become the AI software players. And that example that you gave with Apple partnering with NVIDIA is just a very aha moment for me, as it was for a lot of people watching. I want to bring up some of these questions now. We have the first one with Timothy Vincent, uh, quite a direct one for you, Beth. He says, can one invest or place money with IO fund teams? I love that question. Uh, right now, we're a portfolio that uh, puts out trade alerts. So we put out like nine trade alerts on NVIDIA under 200. So I wasn't just talking uh, 
on interviews. We were actually putting out real-time trade alerts. And uh, we actually have uh, an audited result coming out from 2023. Uh, our results are really bigger and better than I ever thought would be possible for our team. And we started out as a hypothesis, can a small team outperform you know, the ETFs and the hedge funds? And our cumulative over four years is going to be 130%. Uh, arc in the same time period is negative 10. Uh, and this is from picking the big winners. So what we offer is research, real-time trade alerts, full transparency. Every minute we trade a stock, you know it in instant time. Um, and uh, we've created uh, you know, an exceptional team that I, even I'm shocked by at times. And so this is going to be one of the bigger announcements we've ever had. And it's coming out next week in Business Wire. Uh, our audited results and cumulative four year, which put our 2023 at 56.9. If we were a hedge fund, we would have been number four in the United States, um, according to Wall Street Journal. So all that would be sourced so people can reference where we would have ranked. Um, we thought about uh, starting an ETF. Uh, right now, every trade we make is public and uh, our results are audited by a big firm in San Francisco. So we function uh, very transparently like an ETF does. And uh, we've started to talk to distributors to see uh, what the interest is and there's interest right now. So we'll see what happens. And of course, if you want special pricing to uh, IO fund, you can go to realvision.com slash Beth and we have a great deal for you there. I want to jump to the next question. Of course, Jordy, feel free to jump in whenever, even though a lot of these will be uh, directed at Beth. Paul English uh, asking the next question. NVIDIA has price targets ranging from $608 to $1,400, according to analysts polled by Capital IQ. What's your price target for NVIDIA, Beth? Uh, I'll go, uh, let's say 2030. Uh, I'm going to go over minimum 10 trillion market cap. Um, but how we get there will, of course, be determined by the broader tech sector, um, as well as S&P 500. I mean, there's many forces that come into play. Uh, right now, what I can tell you is that NVIDIA's valuation is hovering around where it was in the October 2022 low. This is very eerie. We're calling it eerily low valuation. Uh, this is a buy on dips. Uh, but just know that in contrast, Microsoft is sitting at like a Mount Everest valuation. I mean, if you go and look at the chart, it's just a it's like a ski slope or something. It's like a dangerous slope. And so can NVIDIA just keep moving in a vacuum. Uh, we're waiting for a breather and we'll probably continue to layer into NVIDIA at that time. Um, so I hope that those two things make sense that NVIDIA as its own stock, low valued should reach a minimum of 10 trillion uh, by 2030. And majority of that, in my mind, the surprise that's left is gonna be AI software. Everyone thinks this is, G this is a GPU story, uh, which it is. But uh, that's well understood. Could get you to you know three four trillion. But that bigger powerful move is AI software. And don't forget that AI software will also include automotive. Yeah, I don't think I understood that quite so clearly until this conversation. Moving on to the next uh, question, uh, Yunaki Chang: AI replaces white collar workers, and the robot replaces blue collar workers. Do you see any equivalent of Nvidia? in robotics. Start with you again, Beth. Uh, we're in, in video. We'll are basically AI will just replace. Uh, they're, they're putting the number right now at 300 million jobs, I think is the question. Uh, and certainly NVIDIA is in the center of that. Um, and that is a concern. I will say that most technological advancements have had these concerns to some extent, but now that, you know, mobile and internet and software have been proliferated. Uh, you've got people in Africa, people in India that can now be web developers. Uh, they can work remotely on teams. Uh, you know, we have an excellent web developer from Nepal that we use who's top notch. Uh, so it's like as much as there was concerns usually around most technological advancements, um, somehow, some way, they actually improve our lives. So I'd like to stay in the utopia side. The dystopian side to what you're describing that is a concern to me is that big tech concentration. Because if it's so concentrated, uh, Naval uh, Ravikant, um, excellent thought leader with blockchain, calls what we live in an oligarchy. And I completely agree with him, which is that you know this, this 
country is run by very few. And as much as we want to put attention on the president, it's actually big tech. And big tech is controlling people in all, all ways possible. Um, and I've been a big outspoken person on this. And I know this sounds like I'm getting into a tangent here, but I think that the more pressure that we put on that decentralized AI, uh, even as the masses, is going to be really important because uh, you know we want this to improve people's quality of life, not completely eradicate them. So there's definitely ways to get there. And uh, I think that, you know, probably my money would go on phenomenal blockchain uh, developers that cause that migration away from big tech. And, and any specific robotics companies that you, you really single out? I mean, I guess uh, when I think of robotics companies that are most promising right now, for some reason, I go to software. I think something more like UiPath, um, mm. you know, their automation with software robots. Um, and then, of course, NVIDIA. So what NVIDIA is doing for what is important for the robotics world uh, with Omniverse is they create a, a virtual simulator to where you can train robots in a virtual world. Um, so I like to compare, I go, I go back to Tesla, like I like to compare this because it's easy to understand is that Tesla had to put out a lot of physical EVs and fleets in order to train that data. NVIDIA at the same time had a virtual world that they were training for um, autonomous driving. They were training robots in the Omniverse. So they could create a cat that the car had to stop for. They could create the old lady that you have to stop the car for, or like a blizzard that suddenly shows up rather than finding that in the real world. The Omniverse uh, software that, for me, everyone talks about the Blackwell architecture that came out of GTC. I think it's Omniverse is the bigger announcements. Um, is where the robotics world will start to actually see more promise. I can't think of a company right now that is uh, investable to me, but I think you know in one to two years' time, with uh, Omniverse being integrated more with these cloud APIs, it's going to become more of a possibility that a robotics company could succeed because they can train them in the virtual world. Got it. Sam, fascinating. I, fascinating. Sam, go I, go I, ahead. I do have something to add here. I, it just just because the question gets into an important part of this conversation at two levels. Um, so in talking about job losses from AI, um, you know, instead of saying people lose jobs, what we have a labor shortage right now. And, you know, it's interesting to me that during a labor shortage, people are worried about there not being enough jobs. And whenever there's a situation like that, you have to kind of dig a little deeper. I also hear complaints that younger people don't want to work as much. Uh, and at the same time, the total value of household net worth across the globe is $500 trillion. The issue you run into is if assets keep going higher and the efficiency and the productivity boom keeps going, what is the value, you know, what is the value in jobs the same way it was? And I agree with with Novel and I agree with what with Beth said, which is why I'm strongly in favor of decentralization becoming more of a power movement, the same way that global um, populism has been a movement. The younger, the younger generation, the creators, the innovators, the idea makers are going to want a bigger take. And that's what's going to be offered in a world that right now you don't have. And I think that goes for the VC world as well. I think having a company where the owners of the ideas end up only owning 20 to 30 percent of their ideas is going to change and it's going to be flipped. And I think that is a movement that is going to be there. And I think people are just going to work less hours and be able to pro, uh, you know, still have net worth that is less dependent on maybe wages. And I think we're just at a turning point. So I'm less on this robotics will end jobs and more towards people are going to have more time to get a bigger take. And, and that's going to free up a lot of money that's been trapped in other places for um a concentrated wealth component of the world. So I just think this is a different trend that's happening. No, it's a quite sobering, I guess somewhat optimistic uh, angle to, to look at that. We, we have two questions. Uh, first one for Beth from Gary Winters, but then he has a follow-up, which is uh, for you, Jordy. So uh, we'll do the first question from Gary. Beth, which industries, companies will benefit most from AI? You, you touched on this when you talked about the companies, Beth, but industries though, could you take it a bit broader and look at the, the industries? Sure. So as a, an analyst for public investors, if I'm too early, then I, it's the equivalent of being wrong. So I want to basically make that disclaimer that when I usually talk, I'm talking the next year, the next 12 months. 
Um, we did touch on cybersecurity, but the reason why I like cybersecurity, and, and we did write about this on the free side, is that uh, it already is an industry that has run a lot of automation. It's based on data, and it can just get better and sharper um, on you know threat detection. And this is an industry, cybersecurity, that tends to grow every year, no matter what the broader economy is doing. It gets more and more expensive to protect companies uh, from cyber attacks. And you can imagine the fallout if a company goes through a cyber attack. So it's one of those very rare areas where we tend to see growth no matter what the broader economy is doing. So that piece is nice because like when we first started the conversation, it's that TAM and that GDP contribution along with the product of the GPU that created NVIDIA's surge. So when you take like the product of cybersecurity that has been working with data and automation already for many years, add a generative AI feature to that, plus the fact that this market tends to grow, this industry tends to grow every year, no matter what, um, those pieces are lining up well, in my opinion. Um, the other one I, I did touch on, I don't, I, I think we could have a whole conversation on this is edge AI. Do not underestimate the impact of AI going to the edge. We're talking in, in our minds, laptops are archaic. Um, mobile, who cares? iPhone, et cetera. This is not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about like probably one of the first upgrade cycles uh, that we've really ever seen across these edge devices. So in a couple of years time, the way that your laptop functions, the way that your mobile phone functions will not look anything like it does today. And so that piece is really, really important to remember too. Those are the two I see in the near term that have that bigger impact. And, and just to be clear, you see that as a boon for companies like Apple, I'm not trying to use Apple specifically, but companies like Apple, then you see mega upgrade cycles. So what we need to see from Apple, um, and I would, the, my hesitation, as you could probably hear it in my voice, is <laughs> that they, you know, have an announcement this week with Google. So I'm not really sure what that announcement is about. I would need more time to flesh that out. But um, I'm, you know, I, I like some of the semiconductors around this PC upgrade with ARM. Um, ARM's way overvalued right now, but there's some that are partnering with ARM to move away from x86 on laptops to move into ARM-based PCs. That's going to be a big move. Um, and then there's some at the edge network that are also really important. So Apple, going back to your question, I need to get more time on what's going on here at Apple. Um, I didn't love that Google announcement this week. Uh, in terms of a frenemy, I mean, it's Android, you know, I mean, this is their arc enemy uh, in this, and, and at least in the United States, they have more competition in China, of course, but um, yeah. So I need to understand that piece better before I can talk accurately on Apple. Uh, I love your specificity and uh, your suspicion as well, Beth. Um, Jordy, going uh, to the second question from Gary Winters, Jordy, which energy sector do you see gaining traction in the next few years? Tapping into your uh, your macro space there, Jordy. That that's a that's a hard question um, because I think a lot of the benefits that are going to come are going to be disruptive to the public markets. I think a lot of the ideas, and this is why I brought up Deep Mine. And I and I'll 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 answer the question without exactly answering the question. When I started talking about deep mind and some of the greatest problems, the question that I spend probably 70% of my time, you know, in macro rabbit holes is the question of why do we age? And the reason that fits into the answer of the energy problem is what AI allows us to do is get to the nano answers that we've never been able to as a species. We're able to get to how can we make other alternative energies by solving the framework for how they're made in the first place. If you think about how archaic it is that we're still on fossil fuels and we have fusion, we have different, or we have other ways nuclear to already deal with this. I think it's a really hard answer because the governments will, will stop things. But I also think on the flip side, any kind of advancements that we see in, in artificial intelligence will probably benefit private companies more than public companies. So 
I would rather take the case that the fossil fuel side is going to be disrupted and you can invest in it if you want to you know, deal with cash flow and dividends for a period of time because oil can't go to zero in a day. But I think for any of the energy sides, it's very, very difficult to, to, to forecast what the solution on the energy side is going to be. And I think it's very difficult on a lot of these companies that are green that uh, that how they're going to survive. So I'm not just, I'm not avoiding the question, but I really, I think it's very, very difficult when it comes to some of these uh, artificial intelligence driven solutions. Got it. I'm just going to finish up with the last question from Timothy Vincent directed at you, Beth, what type of pullback in markets would get your team motivated to back the truck up on Microsoft and NVIDIA again? Yeah, that's a great question. Cause uh, when we buy, you you know, people get, just pay uh, constant alerts on their phone. Um, and that hasn't happened for a little bit now because it's a risk reward thing. I would say that uh, my uh, the portfolio manager, he uses a mix of the S&P 500. He likes to see the S&P 500 risk reward being favorable, which is a little unique. Uh, not all tech portfolios are that interested in the broad market. And then he looks uh, within them charts and this is pretty in-depth stuff. I mean, it ranges from Elliott Wave to GAN to, you know, he hedges with uh, leveraged ETFs. I mean, it's, you know, deep in the weeds there. And ultimately, um, on my side, I give the green light, a yellow light or a red light on valuation. I have a green light on NVIDIA as a stock, but uh, we're waiting to see what the broad market does. I have a red light on Microsoft, and we did talk about that in January. Uh, Microsoft is very overvalued. Um, and so we would need to see that come down in order to, um, you know, back the truck up. And so I wish I could give you an exact moment other than uh, we do a lot of work on the free side. We do a lot of work on this marketplace uh, with Real Vision. And we're crystal clear about when we plan to buy, uh, when that time comes. And it's a lot of uh, transparency activity webinars every week for over an hour discussing uh, broad market technical charts. So a lot of information in that question that you're asking. Um, and, you know, we do, we, we just do a lot of work there, but right now I don't have a perfect answer. Well, just to recap this very fascinating conversation, Beth talking about looking at the, the AI players as software players, folks like NVIDIA, also keeping the focus on edge networking and that ruthless cutback, as uh, Beth called it, uh, away from cloud, uh, calling it a landmine. 50% of cloud stocks on the market today may not be around in 10 years. So quite some, some takeaways there. Jordy, really appreciate you coming on, talking about how you've adjusted some of your frameworks based on, on best research. And Beth, always incredible to have you around. Folks know they can find great deals to your content at realvision.com slash Beth as part of a, our partnership in the Real Vision Marketplace. We know what big fans people are of your content. Always appreciate when you come on. We're going to continue How to Unfuck Your Future tomorrow. It's going to be the final installment of the series. We're going to be talking to Dr. Bill Cap, CEO of Fountain Life. Uh, that conversation, I can't tell you how excited Rao is for that one. A really meaningful conversation. And then we're going to wrap it all up on a special edition of Real Vision Daily Briefing tomorrow. We'll have Rao on there. Uh, Jamie Coots, our chief crypto anal analyst here at Real Vision. So look out for both of those tomorrow. And Jordy and um, Beth, thanks for unfucking our future. Thanks, Thanks, Sam. thanks Real Vision. Thanks, Samuel. Thanks, Beth. Appreciate it. We hope you enjoyed the video. At Real Vision, we help you understand the complex world of finance, business, and the global economy with in-depth analysis from real experts. Join the revolution at realvision.com.